Hi, this is Jeff Schroeder from the Smashing Pumpkins, and you're listening to the Nothing Shocking Podcast. Want to know what's going on in the world of music? Then tune in to the Nothing Shocking Podcast, a non-genre-based, all-ages friendly rock and roll program. Join us weekly for interviews with all your favorite rock stars from the mainstream to the underground. You can find us at nothingshocking.libsyn.com or anywhere you download podcasts. Welcome to the night. You think you know Night Demon? Then the Night Demon Heavy Metal Podcast is for you. Step into the darkness as we peel back the curtain to give you an unprecedented, all-access look into the mind and the heart of the demon. We're talking band history, song analysis, studio anecdotes, stories from the road. It's everything a diehard Night Demon fan could want and more. This is the only place to learn the inside scoop, the deep dive trivia, the untold tales from the band members themselves and those closest to the Night Demon story. Need more? The sacred Night Demon crypt will be pried open to reveal demo recordings that have never before seen the light of day. All with in-depth commentary by the band and the people who were there for the writing and recording process. This is a gold mine, a treasure trove of all things Night Demon. Head over to nightdemon.net or wherever you listen to podcasts. We're putting the band back together. The numbers all go to 11. I'm talking about bands that rock. Led Zeppelin. What about Sabbath? ACDC. Motorhead. Does that mean it's louder? Is it any louder? Well, it's one louder, isn't it? We're not worthy. We're not worthy. Why don't you just make 10 louder and make 10 be the top number and make that a little louder? These go to 11. I get up above the ground and raise my head days like this. Think I should be dead. One for Satan, two for me. Let's cheat the devil. It's fun, don't you agree? Welcome to the Nothing Shocking Podcast. I'm your co-host, Jeff Unteed, and with me in Dog Bowl Studios is... Coach Nez. You can find the Nothing Shocking Podcast on Lipson or any pod catchers. Like our Facebook page or follow us on Twitter at No Shock Pod. You can also find the Nothing Shocking Podcast on Rock Rage Radio every Sunday morning at 7 a.m. Central Time. New time. Yeah. Our sponsor is Ragged Records, located in downtown Rock Island, Illinois, soon to be coming back July 17th to downtown Davenport, Iowa. We'd like to thank the Hong Kong Sleepover for allowing us to use their music for our intro and bumper ending. Tonight's guest is... Jeff Schroeder of the Smashing Pumpkins. And the Violet Burning. Yeah. So it was an excellent interview. Actually, it was a po- postponed interview because yeah. my uh, basement flooded uh, <laughs> a few weeks before that, so we had to postpone it. But regardless, we got him back on. What a great interview. Yeah. I'm really excited. I think they're working on new material. Or? Yeah. It should be out, what, 2022? Yeah. I, I, I guess what th- over thirty songs, double yeah, album. That's what he said. Yeah, so we're excited. We're excited to bring you this interview. All right. Good night. Good night. Jeff, welcome to the Nothing Shocking Podcast. I'd like to introduce to you my co-host, Jeff Unteed. Jeff, it's going to be fun to talk to you tonight. Thank you guys. Fant- Happy to be here. Fantastic. Well, you know, COVID-19 has handcuffed the music industry. How have you remained creative during this lockdown process? Um, well, luckily for me that I have a fairly uh, work, a fairly decent home studio and so I'm able to do a lot of recording here. And so I've done lots of that and, um, and from projects ranging from smashing pumpkins, guitar tracks and to stuff like, like video collaborations mm-hmm. that were just for fun to, um, working on some solo material as well. So I've actually, uh, you know, too, I scored, um, like some art installation things as well, and I just wrote a theme for Billy Corgan's uh, next pay-per-view wrestling 
Oh, um, cool. The event that's happening on June 6th for uh, nice. that's going to be on. Yeah, it's a, I wrote the theme music for it and and collaborated with on the guitar with uh, Michelangelo Badio. Oh, you familiar cool. with him? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So it's completely metal. 80s metal shred fest thing is so it's really good so that, i mean so it's in that respect i'm very fortunate and lucky to be able to to do all that work and and be able to do it from the comfort of my own home and in fact you know i really like it and i've been able to kind of i could actually move back to los angeles from chicago it'll be almost actually it's coming up on a year actually um and so I've been re- really able to dial in this space, and it's a much nicer working environment than I had in Chicago. No offense to Chicago, but you know, with the room that I had there was basically no windows, dark. <laughs> but where now I have you know two big windows, and I'm able to have a bunch of plants, and it's so it's and it's a bright open space, which I prefer, and so it's great, you know, because you know sometimes working in the studio can be like you don't see daylight for, mm. you know, months at a time. Um, so, yeah, so it, so that's, I've been doing that. And, you know, I, you know but I've also, I, I did some other things where I um, took a couple creative writing classes because, you know, before I joined the Pumpkins, I was getting my doctorate in comparative literature at UCLA. Oh, yeah. And so I always wrote more academically focused essays and whatnot, but I wanted to, to kind of try my hand at doing some creative work and so i i i did i've done taken two classes and and doing that so that's been an awesome experience and i've also you know took a bunch of like i took an online uh history of electronic music course as well so yeah, <laughs> yeah so i've been i've been doing tons of fun stuff but you know now that um you know the world is kind of slowly starting to open back up you know I have that window of kind of freedom is <laughs> is slowing down so so, <laughs> so now get, getting back to, to real work and real deadlines and whatnot because we actually have some shows in September so mm-hmm. that's kind of like a big um, some big things looming for us so yeah, that's kind of right. which is great so that kind of gives you some like a more of a strict time frame uh, you know, I got to tip my hat to people who take classes for the fun of yeah. it. Because after I <laughs> after I finished my master's program, I said to myself and I said to all my family members, I'm never taking yeah. another upper level college course ever again. It's done. It's over with. I, I can't do it anymore. So yeah. I, I tip my hat to you. Yeah. Oh, I totally get it. And, I, and I, I was that way for a long time. But these were, you know, I, I have chosen things that I really love and and wanted to do but i have to say that the creative writing class was very challenging because it was very much out of my comfort zone and it required week you know to turn in assignments weekly and you had to share it with the you know with my um fellow students and it did feel a little bit of like i've i've i I know what you mean because i felt like a little bit like i've taken one too many classes in my life (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Jeff, you got the next one? Oh, yeah. You might have uh, answered this other places, but, you know, um, for our listeners here that might not know, um, you know, when the Smashing Pumpkins broke up and, and disbanded and we thought the end of the world was coming and then, we're all, <laughs> and then all of a sudden we get a new album, Zeke Heist, and we get uh, some new members of the band uh, and we get to discover Jeff Shorter. Can you talk a little bit about uh, your journey in uh, with uh, joining the Smashing Pumpkins? Yeah, sure, of course. Um, you know, I had... You know, I was, you know, I was a fan of the band since basically as soon as they were known outside yeah. of the Chicago area. I, I think I've been trying because you know that this was just recently the 30th anniversary of Gish, yeah. mm-hmm. the Gish album coming out, and so I was trying to think when I first became aware of the band, and I'm pretty sure, I mean, I had a lot of friends in in high school at the time that were into Jane's addiction and obviously the, you know, the title of your podcast, nothing shocking. Yeah, yes. And, and so I don't know if it was through that because i you know, at that time, smashing pumpkins were very much considered like, uh, like, Oh, they're kind of like, you know, that was like the biggest reference point was they're kind of like Jane's addiction, which meant there was kind of this blending of, of heavy guitar solos, um kind of psychedelia and and whatnot um but i also but but then i really remember seeing there was a little half page article in guitar world because i was a guitar fanatic 
and it had I remember a picture of Billy with kind of this strat like over his shoulder and I read it and it talked about you know, it's kind of psych- heavy psychedelic band, Hendrix-esque solos. And but re- the funny thing is what really sold me on the band was the fact that it listed that they used this uh, ADA MP1 preamps, which were these kind of, at the time, state-of-the-art guitar preamps that bands like uh, White Lion and Skid Row and these kind of more Paul Gilbert from Racer X and Mr. Mm-hmm. Big were using. And so I was really like, oh, my God, that's so cool. Like this seems like something I'd really be into. So um, I, I probably I, I must have gone out almost immediately and bought the record and just <laughs> fell in love with the band. Um, so I was I was a fan of the band from that time. And so I followed the band all the time till they threw to, till they broke up at the time when they um, were reforming in 2006. But uh, when it but it was just Billy and Jimmy, I was in the middle of my doctorate program at UCLA and a friend of mine um, a former uh, bandmate of mine from some of my L.A. bands um, texted me and said, hey, a friend of mine works for the management company um, of the Smashing Pumpkins. They're reforming, but James and Darcy aren't coming back. They're going to be looking for another guitar player and a bass player. I really think you should um, go for this. I think this is something that's really would suit you. But what is strange to me be, um because I never, ever tried out for another band in my life. I only started, you know, I was like, you know, I started, I was in my own bands. I started bands with friends, but I never, I wasn't in L.A. passing my bio around and my 8x10 <laughs> trying to get gigs. Because a lot of people do move out here to do that specifically. But but that wasn't um, anything I ever did. And so when he said to do this, he gave me the manager's phone number, email. I don't remember the man. I think email the manager wrote me and said, Hey, can you send us a bio and, and a photo? And I'm like, I don't have any of this stuff. I don't. <laughs> so I, I just wrote one myself, but, and, and because I was such a big fan of the band, I think I really knew, I was like, I knew the best guitar players to write for like influences that would really, you know, <laughs> peak Billy's interest. You know what I mean? So um I was and so um I got a call like within days and I think you know it, it, it was a very long process. Like I think we we met Bill me and Billy and Jimmy met for lunch somewhere first and just kinda hung out and and talked and then um I started jamming a little bit which is jimmy and we'd try different bass players out and then so that went on for a couple months and then finally after they tried out a few guitar players and a bunch of bass players you know, you know they jimmy was like i really think like you and then ginger reyes who's now ginger pooley mm-hmm. i think you two are the one you know ones and then billy came down and we jammed and it actually was that that jam was actually horrible like, like terrible <laughs> like it went so bad like you know me and billy me and i'm sorry me and jimmy and ginger had been playing a lot together and really getting these songs tight we're like wow this sounds really you know jimmy's like wow this sounds great like this is going to be awesome so we finally get that billy comes down we play like one song he's like i, I don't really want to play this stuff he's like i got some new riffs that we've been recording let's play these new you know and they were like <laughs> You know, it, I remember it was that song "United States" off the Zeitgeist, and it oh, was, yeah. you know, like a crazy riff. I'd never played anything with that groove or that heavy, and it just was like had all these syncopated accents and stuff. And they just they had been recording it, so they had it down super tight, and it was just like notes flying all over the room. And I was totally embarrassed. I could not even keep up. I was like, "Oh my god, this is horrible." And so I thought I was done. I thought I was. I thought it was done. I thought it was completely over. And um, but for what is, <laughs> I don't know what happened. Um, a few weeks later, they called and were like, um, "They're like, yeah, we thought that jam was awesome, and you know, we want to kind of continue this. Kind of, we want to continue moving forward." So, and then eventually, even then, a few weeks after that, they're like, "Okay." you guys are in the, you know, you guys are going to be in the band. And Mm. so it, but it was, it, it was like a period of, I would say like four months or something. It wasn't quick, you know? So it was, it was maybe even longer. I feel like it might've been even like five months of, of playing from the time of having lunch to the time of getting the gig. And, 
you know, I thought many times like it's going to happen. It's not going to happen. Like, like, you know, it, it was, it, it was a crazy <laughs> time in my life. And, you know, and, I've, and it was like, Oh my God, now I've gotten the gig, but that, like, the craziness hadn't even really started. <laughs> I mean, that was just like the, like the preamble to the, tr- to the true madness. And it was then into rehearsals for the first tour. And it was just, I mean, I'd never done anything so intense. It was a really great learning experience, but um, I will say that for both myself and Ginger is that we, you know, we really worked hard and we were both like, we wanted to be great and wanted the band to be great. And we, and so we had no problem um, like putting in the work, but it, it sure was a lot of work to do that first tour. It, you know, it since then it, it, it's like, I'm able to enjoy it a lot more back that, that first tour around the world uh, as great as it was. And we headlined like all these all the big festivals all over Europe and the United States. I didn't really enjoy it too much because I was just was so nervous and trying not to, to mess up that I couldn't really enjoy like what it was. I was just so focused on trying to do a good job that more recently we did another, we played a lot of those festivals again and it was, and it was, and I told myself, you're going to just enjoy this for what it is. And it, and it was just so wonderful to go and do it again. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, currently, you've been in the studio with the rest of the Smashing Pumpkins. Uh, can you talk more about the new material that you guys have been recording? Um, yeah, it's, you know, um, we're doing, it's, it's you know, Billy kind of announced this, but sometimes people are confused about what's going on. So what we're doing now is a sequel the third part of, I guess, a trilogy that would be kind of these semi-related concept albums of, of Melancholy and the Infinite Sadness, mm. Machina, and now this album, oh, cool. which I don't know the title. I ha- I'm not, I haven't heard that there is a title yet. There, there might be, but uh, I'm not aware of it. But <laughs> so this is going to be a big, um, sprawling work. Thirty-three songs. Oh wow! And, um. We're about, I would say, all the material has been written and tracked at, you know, some of the, like, just very, very basic stuff. And um, now we're kind of really going in and working on, like, guitar and keyboard kind of stuff. And I, I would say we're about a qu- I wouldn't even say a third, but probably a quarter of the way done. How do you wrap? You know, how do you wrap your head around thirty three songs? Yeah. It's really it, it 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 it's it's um, well you just I know it sounds silly but you really just take it one by one day by day and we're kind of working sequentially that way and obviously we're still working remote um, because this album was started during COVID and James and I are out here in L A and Billy and Jimmy are in the Chicago area. Um, Luckily for Jimmy, the jump, the drums are already done because you always do the drums first, and then it's like you kind of go back and start building the tracks up from there. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's uh, right now mostly just Billy, James, and I working, and um, and James has his own kind of studio situation. I have my own studio situation, and then you know Billy too. So we work that way. We get the tracks. We get on Zoom. We kind of go over like kind of strategies for the song, and then. Um, James and I are just kind of at our studios throwing on our ideas. We send all the files back to Chicago and then they're added to the session. And then we just, and then we'll kind of, once we go through all the songs, we'll start going back and listening to everybody's ideas and start parsing it out and kind of go through once again. So it, it, it's, it's a long and involved process. These are not um, get in the room and jam it out type of <laughs> records. It's they're they're, it, you know, it's from probably from be honestly to to where to where it'll be like say like done. It'll probably take almost a year. Yeah. And I don't know if it would have gone any faster if we were all in the same room together because of just the, the nature of how how it, it would be nice to kind of have a little bit more like a a quicker paced exchange to go. Oh, I really like what you're playing. I like that. Like to where you gotta throw on all your ideas and then get the feedback later and then maybe change it or whatever. But I don't think it would speed up the process actually that much. Cause the way that we record anyway was, is so like 
like microscopic. You know, mm-hmm. every li- every little detail is gone. Every, I mean, there's not one second of sound <laughs> that is not kind of on purpose. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Is there any? I just this one just popped in my head. Is there any? difficulty and transition of like you know when you're when you're recording in different different states and different different rooms and then all of a sudden like trying to throw it together to play live what is that is there what kind of process do you have to do to get to to play it live well you know the um the tech the the gear technology um is getting better to where you know they are Obviously, in the studio, you can use everything from, like, the the computers exclusively to where you're just you're going in and you're using plugins that do are completely digital emulations of stuff to using real amps and microphones and all that kind of stuff. And on a Pumpkins record, we do everything. And like for me, like on guitar, sometimes I'm depending on what it is, sometimes I'm going, I'll, I'll want to go straight into the computer and, but other times I'll use an amp. But what's great about it these days is that you can always just take a, you know, they call it like a, a DI track that's completely unaffected. It's just like raw guitar. And then you can take that and you can actually run that raw guitar file through amps and pedals at some later date mm-hmm. to kind of reshape the sound. But um, to answer your question more specifically, there are so many, like for me, for example, live, like I still use a regular amp, but I also use something called the Helix by Line 6, which is a kind of digital modeling piece of gear that is amp emulations, pedal emulations, effect emulations of pretty much everything that's out there. So you can get basically a digital reproduction of kind of almost almost just about anything that you've done with the traditional amp guitar pedal setup and get like a, a a very very good facsimile of it in the digital realm and so i really utilize that live to kind of translate what's happened in the studio to um um to a live situation and 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 what's great about even using something like Helix is that they have a plug-in version of it too. So oftentimes I'm using that on the computer to record my tracks, and I can take those sounds that are were used there and import them straight into the units that I use live, and it's exactly the same. Oh, so cool! You know, yeah. yeah, So, so that type of um, they have a name for it. I can't remember, you know, but it's like a kind of a synchronicity between all their various platforms of, of work. So whether you're using like the, the hardware units on stage, whether you're using the smaller versions that they make that are like small foot pedal versions that are go on your pedal board to using the plug-in version that they all basically are speaking the same language. And most of what you do on one can be used on one of the other devices so that that makes life a lot easier oh fantastic um i kind of want to switch yeah. gears on you yeah. here uh in, in july you'll be releasing a solo single can you talk to us more about the creative inspiration working as a solo artist opposed to working with the pumpkins yeah well yeah that just kind of happened because you know i had more time and 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 you know, I've dedicated a lot of, of my personal time and energy to the Smashing Pumpkins, which I love. It's it's my basically it's like family. It's 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 home. But, you know, we all have interest outside of the band, too. And, you know, Billy does solo work and James has done solo work and Jimmy has done. So I feel like, oh, gosh, it's probably my time to finally <laughs> to finally do something. But it actually really came out of um, and I actually did. um in 2019 i launched a new band called night dreamer and unfortunately that kind of because it's like starting a new business when you start a new band and that and i feel like unfortunately kind of suffered from coronavirus and that we invested a lot of time energy and and monetary resources into it and then as soon as we started kind of really putting a lot of work in we got shut down and you know had to go in and kind of figure out life and and all that kind of stuff and so during that time i was like wow i don't i don't have that anymore and and pumpkins is it is what it is um and then i i I, the first single that's going to come out 
for me as a solo is this song called Hey Nim, which is a Korean word that means the sun. And it's a song written by, um, that came out originally in 1972 by a, a singer, kind of, she was a kind of a, like a folk singer, like a psychedelic folk singer called mm-hmm. Kim Jung Mi. And it was written by a guitar player called Shin Jun Hyung. And Shin Jun Hyung was, is kind of considered like the godfather of Korean rock guitar, you know? Mm-hmm. And so he, he wrote this song. And so I'd always loved the song and, you know, the, the original is like an, a finger picked kind of acoustic, you know, psychedelic folk song um, about walking around the countryside and kind of being rejuvenated by nature and whatnot. Um, and I kind of heard, I was like, oh, I, I want to redo this. I'm like, I want to do it as this totally blown out, shoegazy guitar track with oh, cool. all these crazy guitar solos and stuff. And, um, yeah, so I, I did a demo of it, and it was like, oh, this sounds really exciting. And then um, I just got together, you know, um, a group of musicians from here, a drummer called Shane Graham, who's in a really cool band out in L.A. called Drag, and my friend Orion Salazar, who was um, he played bass, and he's an incredible, incredible bass player who was ri- the original bass player of Third Eye Blind. And, oh, um, yeah, yeah. And I never, you know, and no offense to Third Eye Blind, be, um, you know, because I'm actually friends with, with with Steven as well a little bit. And, um, you know, they're great people and, and whatnot. But I never knew that, you know, that that Orion was like this savant level bass player. Mm. You know what I mean? I was like, oh, their songs are good. You know what I mean? And now I hear their songs <laughs> on the radio. I'm like, wow, the bass is really good. But, you know, actually Orion and I um, – you know, one of the first times we really hung out was at the NAM show and we were going through different booths together and we went to the you know, Yamaha booth, <laughs> you know, where I which I endorsed and he picked up the Billy Sheehan bass, you know, signature yeah. bass and just started ripping on it like 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 all these Eat him and Sm- David Lee Roth Eat him and Smile wrists with you know, with Billy Sheehan played on and mm-hmm. Jocko wrist and I was like was like, dude, this that guy is incredible. You know what I mean? And so I knew I wanted him, and he's just a, an, an amazing human being as well. And so I was like, I want to have him. And then um, a friend of mine, Hia Hia So, is the singer, and she was out in Georgia though. So so we we actually never, you know, worked together in person. She just did all her work remotely because um, she could sing the song in Korean and, and very well. And she has a really cool, like, kind of Nico-esque voice, which I wanted this kind of Nico, shoegazy kind of singing thing. And it, yeah, it came out really, really great. Um, I recorded at this place called The Cave uh, Studio in Los Angeles. So I did, we did, like, the drums and bass, and I did the, all the guitar at home in the in the sense. I did all the guitar and synth here at my home studio. Uh, and then we mixed it at The Cave. Um, and, uh, yeah, we just got, just got a video done for it, too. Um, a great friend of mine from the Chicago area, um, Sky, uh, did the video, and they are a um, amazing, amazing, super talented analog glitch artist. So the video is super trippy, psychedelic journey. Oh, <laughs> you awesome. know? Um, so I'm really, really stoked with how it came out, and yeah, the song is it's it's pretty cool because it's you know it's weird it's long for a song now you know it's almost. I guess like a little over five minutes, you know, which to me doesn't seem a bit, you know, nowadays that's, I guess, long, yeah, you know, yeah, and, yeah. and, and it has like, it's, it has like at the end, there's just like a crazy guitar solo that just goes on. And, <laughs> you know what I mean? But it's, but it's, um, yeah, but it just felt right to do. And it's, it is, you know, um, so I feel really, really proud of it and really happy. Um, so yeah, that's going to be coming out like the middle of, of july we're just actually confirming the um the release date with the label and the publicist and you know so mm-hmm. I'm, I'm so i'm very excited about it fantastic hey before i let jeff take the next sure. question you tell or Ryan uh, Salazar, how awesome we are! Because I've been trying to get that guy on the podcast. He never messages me back. So please tell him. Are you serious? I'm serious, man. Totally. I sent him two two oh. invitations. So you get on about it and say, "Hey, I will, I will." No, I will. He he. No, he. I don't know. Maybe he's not because he doesn't seem to usually be like like that. I mean, if anything, 
he's very humble and shy, I would say. So it's not because he's trying to blow you off, for <laughs> sure. <laughs> All right, man. Well, hey, let him know that we're that we're stalking him, that we want to get him on the okay. podcast. Yeah. yeah, no, he's, he's, an, he's such a great musician. And actually, you know, um, one of the cool things that I did during COVID is I he – was part of some type of beetle fest type of thing and oh. um it ended up being all online but it, it it was like a i don't know how to it's like a star trek convention but for beetles <laughs> oh, cool. you know what i mean yeah, yeah, and yeah. so usually they have like you know it's held somewhere and people fly from all over the world to go to it and they have bands play but you know i get you know orion is a crazy you know paul mccartney and beetle yeah. or beatles fanatic and so we did um he asked me to do to play on a track. Uh, Maybe I'm amazed um, by Paul. And it was, I you know I I'm unfortunately I can't remember who the the drummer and and singers were on the track because it was there's so many people. But it, you know, but I played on it. Orion and then Alex Skolnick from Testament. Oh, cool. You know, and, nice. and it but and it was it just came out. It was so cool and it was just so fun to play with all these great musicians and something oh. totally different yeah it was great oh that's so cool all right jeff you take yeah. the next question all right so yeah. one, of, one of the things i like about this um doing the research for this podcast is to delve into an artist's background um i i, I discovered the night dreamery we talked about already that was pretty cool to to find that but let's talk about go back a little ways uh, all the way to uh, your beginnings uh, i think it was uh, the violet the violet burning can you talk oh, the little? Violet Burning. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I, I really like that first album. Uh, I think it was from 1996. I think it was a self-titled titled album. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. No, um, that it's funny because that band, I ended up joining that band. Um, so the it, um, I had a, I'll give like the, try to, a little bit more background. So one day, when I was a kid, just playing, you know, just starting to get serious about guitar, I went into a local music store, and um, I don't know, I probably had like a Van Halen shirt on or something. <laughs> and, and so this guy works there. It was like 1986, 87. You know, he's like, "Oh, so you like Van Halen?" I was like, "Yeah, yeah, I do." And so he takes a guitar off the wall, plugs it into an amp, super loud, and starts playing hot for teacher like note for note the intro and eruption and i'm like like jaw just dropped because as you guys know back then no youtube yeah you know nothing you didn't see i i never i i'd never seen anybody play that well like three feet in front of my face (laughs) you know where you're just like can see everything he's doing and it's like loud in a music store and i was like Oh my god! So I, anyway, I started taking lessons from this guy, and so when I was like twelve or thirteen, and did that for four or five years, um, and then kind of towards the end of high school, I, I stopped taking lessons, and like cause I was playing like in a whatever garage band kind of thing, and um, this right after I graduated high school, I ran into my old teacher at a coffee shop, and. I started decided to take lessons from him again, but he we did it this time just from his apartment. And um, he had roommates, and his two roommates were the singer, guitar player, and drummer of the Violet Burning. Oh, cool. And so when I was taking a lesson there, and Michael, who was the lead singer of the Violet Burning, after I left, went and knocked on Dave, my teacher's door, and said, "Hey, who was that you were playing with today?" And Dave was like, "Oh, that's my that was my student Jeff." And he was like, basically, "Hey, you know, our our guitar player, we don't have a guitar player right anymore, and so we're looking for somebody." Which funny is the guitar, and you guys may or may not know, but the guitar player that left the band is this guy named Sean Tubbs. And Sean Tubbs is a very big, he went laid, I mean, for a long time he was playing with Carrie Underwood, yes. he moved to Nashville, became, you know, and he does like a bunch of amazing gear demos and whatnot now on, on YouTube. He's like, one, you know, has a big presence online. And so just a wonderful human too, and a, you know, old, old friend, obviously. And he was brothers with the drummer of that band and anyway, of the violet bridge so <laughs> so um i ended up getting that gig and so it w- what was amazing about it and 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 really unbelievable was that so that was the summer of 1992 it just i just graduated high school and by the fall of that year i was playing all the 
the big clubs in Hollywood. You know, because the scene was very much like in Hollywood at the time. So like the Whiskey, the Troubadour, Roxy, mm -hmm. you know, um, but there's a bunch of other places too, you know, and I just got so lucky that I got able to play in that. And, you know, very quickly we did a demo um, and there was, they used to have this ASCAP, you know, sponsored by ASCAP night at this club called the Coconut Teaser. And the host of that night was this guy, Len Fagan, who was like Donald Fagan from Steely Dan's, mm -hmm. like probably like misfit younger brother. <laughs> and, um, and, and anyway, he was a total sweetheart and he loved our demo and loved the band. And I mean, very quickly he got every A&R person down there to see us. And, um, we almost got like a really, really big record deal, like very early on. Like we did like a showcase at SIR Studios and um, these people who are still very influential in the music industry. I won't name them because they still, you know, are, you know, came down. We're like, we want to sign you. And they put us up in like, you know, because we were from the suburbs. They put us up in a nice hotel, like on Sunset Boulevard. We were like, I just remember that. We were like, <laughs> like, we can't believe it. Like, I was only 18. I was like, I can't. This happened. You know, like, like yeah. it already, I was maybe 19. You know, maybe it turned 19 by the time this happened. I was like, I can't believe it. We didn't have a real manager. We had like a, a kind of a friend who yeah. thought they were a manager. <laughs> <laughs> and they went in and, and, and basically tried to, like, this band is going to be, like, the next U2. You need to give them this. You'd, and, like, they just were like, you know what? We're not going to sign you guys. Oh. We just we changed our changed our mind. And then we, fired, of course, fired that manager, got a real manager. But because we had already like, kind of been seen by everybody and then basically gotten a bad reputation, uh, we couldn't. I mean, we couldn't get arrested. You know, we went from like it be happening so fast to where nothing happened for years, and until uh, we finally got that record deal with this label called Domo Records, which was basically a Japanese type of record deal that they decided to, you know, but also release it in the U.S. and and it was great, you know what yeah. I mean? And um, but um, but it wasn't the same as getting signed to a major at the time when you know alternative music had had been exploding, but you know, an interesting tidbit about this, we did record at um, El Dorado Studios, which was owned by Dave Jordan, who did Nothing Shocking and yep, yeah. um, Dirt by Alice in Chains and all those records. And uh, we worked with Brian, Brian Carlstrom, I think, was the engineer who did Dirt as well. And so it was it was great. It was it was such, such a great learning experience to be able to be in a real studio with a real great engineer and and get like be able to like learn how to get a lot of this is how you get great guitar sounds and all that kind of stuff oh so cool yeah. uh yeah 1996 you joined the lassie foundation which was part of, you were part of three full-length albums multiple eps uh can you talk more about your time during uh the lassie foundation well yeah see how that happened is is so that violet burning album came out and we toured everywhere all over the u.s and then we even um did like a pretty lengthy tour of Europe and um, but things were kind of falling apart a little bit interpersonally in the band because of we were just mismanaged and, and, you know, we were trying our best, but things just weren't really taken off. Mm -hmm. And, and you start going like, I'm not making any money and, <laughs> you know, blah, 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 blah. And then so my friends, you know, my good friends had started this other band, the Lassie foundation. And I was like, well, that's great. I can go home. I can go back, you know, basically get off the road, go back to college and then play in this other band kind of thing. And that's kind of what I did um, for a while. And what was fun about that is because that was very, you know, the whole premise of the band was was more to be like a was more influenced by like 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 where by the burning was very much even though we were an alternative, but it's very much we were like a really good rock band. You know, it was like. You know, and and I really like that. And we we're very pro, like very well rehearsed, rehearsed like a ton, super tight, like very much. It was actually the absolute best training for joining the Smashing Pumpkins because it was a very similar type of work ethic and dynamic. Mm. Um, but Lassie was like, okay, we're influenced by 
My Bloody Valentine, a band out of LA called Medicine, you know, bands like yeah. out of the UK, like Ride, and um, we really love The Verve, you know, as well, and Swerve Driver, and and things like that. Um, and that was kind of where my personal tastes were leaning anyway, and, and so it was really fun, and I really liked that. And then as things kind of progressed, as you know, the landscape of music in the U.S. was changing to where this kind of like indie rock was getting really big too. And so we were able to incorporate more like kind of Sonic Youthy and Sleater Kinney type of sounds like into what we're doing. We after make, cause it, what, and what tends to happen to a lot of shoegaze bands is you make one or two records and you're like, okay, like we kind of got to move away from all the effects and kind of dry up the sound a little bit. And so you have to kind of reinvent the band <laughs> a little bit. Um, <laughs> and so that, so then we went through our, and at the time, it just and it makes me laugh now. It makes me laugh and cringe at the time. Is because if you know if you remember anything about that indie aesthetic of that time, it was like it doesn't matter if you're in tune. It can be a little bit sloppy and this kind of stuff. And now I hear it and I go, oh my god! Like <laughs> why didn't I? I obviously didn't take my guitars in to get them intonated before we go to recording session because. The guitars are so out of tune. <laughs> um, but it has a bit of a charm to it. And so yeah. uh, right now we're actually um, in the midst of, of, of starting to finally re-release all those records because they we, we were signed to a bunch of small indie labels that have, most, that have since gone out of business. So tracking down the masters and actually getting the rights back to our own records has been a bit of a sadly a bit of a process you yeah, know but mm -hmm. i think we finally got everything and um we put out the first dp is now back on streaming services and the first full length pacifico is going to be going up soon and we're getting going to do vinyl for those two we don't because those were kind of our two most popular and i think the ones people will want the most yeah. we'll kind of see after that if we do more physical product but everything is going to be going up on on digital Spotify and, and Apple music and title and, and everything and all that stuff. So, um, and those, and, but, but nowadays, you know, whether it's Violet Burning or Lassie, like those people are like my closest friends. Like it's nice. just, it, it's so great. Like I still am close with everybody and, and it's when, especially with um, like Michael from the Violet Burning is one of my dearest He's like a big brother to me, you know, someone I really look to for guidance and stuff still, you know, and in fact, when I joined, when I was auditioning for the Smashing Pumpkins, I would go to him for like guidance. He let, he had a really great Marshall amp that he let me borrow so I could always sound great at, you know, for the auditions and, and, and so now, every, and he lives in the Boston area. So every time I go through there, we, I, you know, we hang out and I stay at his house if I can and, yeah, just just really, you know, it 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 feels good to to be close to everybody still. Oh, yeah, so cool. Yeah, that's exciting. Yeah, Jeff, you want to take the next one, or am I going to take the next one? Or we uh, to... yeah, um, I guess back to the Smashing Pumpkins a little bit. Uh, the uh, can you talk about the recording process for the last album the, uh, in twenty twenty? You guys released a CYR. And oh, was, Seer, yeah, or yeah. Seer, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Seer was done was finished luckily right before even though it came out during COVID it yeah. was um finished right before that. But uh you know work wise it I did I'm trying to think I trying to go I did a lot of it in Chicago because I was still there. And so I would you know worked a lot at Billy's um studio. And um that was great. You know and that was I think that kind of laid the groundwork for the type of work that we're doing now, it, because I think that the, the, with, cause I think you can only really understand Seer in relation to um, Shiny No So Bright, which came out yeah. before, which, which we did with Rick Rubin. And, um, and that'll kind of give you context for, for some of the decisions that we made for Seer is, um, when James came back to the band, uh, there was really no plan of doing any new music together first. We we're just like, hey, we're going to do this tour. Um, of course, live management and promoters were like, hey, 
maybe it would be great if there was a new song that we could use to help promote the tour to generate <laughs> some, you know, like a buzz. In it. And we're like, oh, that sounds totally fun. That sounds like that sounds great. And, you know, and then I think probably Billy came up with the idea. Maybe we can have Rick Rubin produce it, you know, because that'll be because he's really good at kind of working with more established bands and helping them kind of get in back to their essence. If that you know, so mm-hmm. to speak, you know that he, he's kind of good for he he does that with a lot of bands, and yeah. so we were great, so great. So um, at first, because James was still fil- finishing up a soundtrack soundtrack project he was working on, so he couldn't participate in the very early kind of writing sessions. Just me and Billy and Jimmy were at the Village Recorder in L.A. just cutting demos, like we'd you know work on one or two songs a day and record them right then, and either. I would play bass or guitar, Billy played bass, guitar, just, and then we kind of do some quick overdubs and then just move on. And But during that, like, two weeks or so, we ended up doing, I don't know, like 15 demos mm. and to give to Rick with the idea that we would do one, record one song. Mm. <laughs> so we went up to Shangri-La, and, <laughs> and I think Billy went up, like, the night before, and... And, you know, we get there the first day and we're like, so what song are we going to do? And he's like, he hasn't decided yet. (laughs) (laughs) We're like, okay, so we're there the first day and, um, you know, like, he's like, well, I really think that um, he's like, like, can you guys go and play some of these songs down in the room so we go play some of the songs? He's like, you know, I'd really like to hear all these songs acoustic too because i just want to hear the song as the song so then billy did you know and then it's like three or four days went by of this kind of like <laughs> we're like when's he gonna we're only supposed to be here a week we're like on day four now yeah. we have to what's the song you know <laughs> and so then he is like you know then he came in and he goes you know i'm sorry i haven't chosen the song but i really think there's some exciting things here and i really think we should record eight of these songs mm. You know, because I feel like this really captures yeah. a certain moment in time that you'll never have again. Yeah. And so, of course, you're like, yeah, no problem. You know, what do you, what are you gonna say? Like, no, you know, you don't, you don't know, you don't know what you're talking about. So you're like, of course, and that's what we ended up doing. And so that's how we ended up making that. Like, you know, really, eight songs for the Smashing Pumpkins is an EP, even though it's yeah. but it's too long because they're the EP. But it's not really an album type statement from the band. And but and it was recorded to be like like the amount of day like studio days was maybe three weeks, and that's you know in most Smashing Pumpkins records it, it takes longer than three weeks to get the drum sounds you know what I mean <laughs> I'm just <laughs> I'm just exaggerating but yeah. that's I what I'm trying to convey is that it's very 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 quick for a Smashing Pumpkins record and it's a very different type of recording so. This comes up to answer your question about Sears. So when we decided after we did the Shiny No So Bright tour, during the kind of the towards the end of that tour, we talked about, hey, let's do another record. But it really needs to be a record where the band is stepping into the present and stepping forward because the Shiny No So Bright EP, a record with Rick, was very much about kind of celebrating the history of the band you know, to a certain extent. And yeah. so Sear was very much like, we want to take the band and show that we are a creative unit in the here and now. And this is like completely new music that we're making. And so maybe to a degree that's not as severe on the new one that we are currently working on, on Sear, anything that really sounded like, like the old stuff we stayed away from. Mm-hmm. So, so it would be like a very much a, a sonic and aesthetic departure so a lot of the work was was very difficult in doing that because there's a lot of stripping away and trying things and going no that's that doesn't feel right that feels like too much like the old stuff let's keep on moving forward and trying to set um a new uh a, like new boundaries of aesthetics and whatnot and um so it was a very difficult record i want to say like difficult like hard but like it was a a very thought through process. Yeah. You know, it wasn't, again, you know, we tend not to make records where it's like get in the room and jam it out. It's very much like it's a laboratory of trying things, seeing what sticks, you know, seeing what 
feels right moving forward, taking little bits of information and then finding clues in there and then continuing moving forward kind of in the dark into new realms, new territory. Oh, and yeah. so progressive yeah. in, in the thought process. Yeah. Um, yeah. I want to really want to change gears on you here. Yeah, I only have a couple more questions for you, but you received your bachelor's huh? degree from Cal State Long Beach and you received your graduate studies from UCLA. Um, how have you been able to uh, relate your literature degree into your musical career? Um, it's interesting because some people feel like it's all so different. And, and, and obviously uh, being on a college campus and, and being in academia is much different than being backstage at a rock concert. <laughs> you know I mean, uh, your two kind of work environments are, are much different. But let's say from a more – from the artistic side of things, I think that as a well-rounded artist – you're very much looking for inspiration in multiple realms and, and dimensions. And it doesn't have to be artistic ones. Like as I've kind of grown older and, and matured, like I get a lot of satisfaction from doing things like gardening. You know, I have like, you know, thinking of like plants and, and growing vegetables and, and stuff. It really, kind of feels like a, 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 a creative part of me, you know, or even now, um, since I moved back to LA, I really get a lot of inspiration from riding my bike through these neighborhoods around here. Um, but on a more kind of like strictly artistic level, I've always been interdisciplinary in the way that to me, like novels and poetry and film and painting and all these things really, and and then of course music, they really speak to each other. And there've been, of course, there's so many connections. Um, so even like I'm kind of, like I said, like I'll talk you know a little more personally about like say like you know I'm kind of putting together my first solo work is going to be an EP. There's like I kind of set aside a whole collection of novels films I'm watching, albums I'm listening to that kind of speak to the sounds, textures, themes, ideas that I want to kind of seep inside of me, you know, and I wouldn't say that I'm looking at it as like a direct influence because I don't really, I mean, I, I don't really think that way any much anymore. People often ask like, who are your favorite guitar players or who are your influences? It's not really like that for me. I've been a student of, music and art and literature and film for so long that it's I'm trying to transition more into a, a phase where I think like what is the feeling or emotion that's trying to come out and then as a as a you know kind of student of all this stuff what are the different techniques and things that are there that I'm aware of that can help bring this into life mm. you know so mm. For example, so when you, yeah, I knew like for that cover of Hey Nim, I was doing, it's already a song that's already been written, but you know, there's like the, the structure of the song, the very, the notes and the chords and the melody, it's just a shell and you can take that shell and, and completely, you know, some, you know, really great songs usually can be reimagined in hundreds of different ways and we see that with things like the beatles right like yeah, you hear all different types of versions and and it's it's really amazing how well the chords and melodies translate into different types of songs it, it's unbelievable and so i i knew i could hear this but then it was like thinking like well what is it that i wanted to sound like and i'm like i knew i wanted the guitar to be blown out kind of like the rhythm guitar to be kind of blown out like brad laner but I wanted to have kind of some like Vi, Satriani, even Ingve Malmsteen type of things like over the top, you know. And then there's like like Brian Eno esque, like craft work as synths in there too, because it's trying to create like translate like kind of the way that I hear these feelings that this song evokes in me. And so that's like, but. Anytime I'm doing it, it could be a, another range of influences. It's like not every song I do is going to be conveyed through those same set of influences. But, you know, there's a certain – at a given period of time, there are definitely things that I want to surround myself with. And like I said, that and that is 
a certain set of books and films and paintings and stuff that are kind of that are inspiring me. So like to me, like being a student of literature, it, it was I just was so interested in in it, like just like I interested in finding out about what, you know, chords Jimi Hendrix played or what kind of effects he used or how did Kevin Shields get that guitar sound or what is Thurston Moore and Lee Ronaldo's tunings mm -hmm. or, you know, how's Satriani using, you know, this legato technique to give that kind of flying through space type of sound that I really want to maybe be able to utilize sometime. And so to me, learning about literature and, <clears throat> and that history and stuff is, is, is very much the same way. I just, I didn't do it for any, practical reasons other than interest oh. yeah. yeah yeah oh well said uh yeah well that's kind of concluded uh our time limit here so um that being said is was there anything that we did not cover tonight that you wanted to plug and promote oh i don't know no i think i i think i i promoted all my all i got going on <laughs> so yeah. which is great you know so i appreciate that oh, let me get all that all oh that absolutely stuff yeah so uh yeah. Th this is how it's going to work uh we have about three weeks worth of episodes ahead of yours so we're looking about three weeks before this is going to be uh, available for um a download for our all listeners good. Good. but I'll, I'll make sure that you get it first and foremost that's what's most important yeah we you were supposed to come here to uh the quad cities uh, last uh, summer and uh, 2020 got they got canceled obviously but uh oh uh, with guns yeah no with uh well no you guys were going to be at the rust belt in moline and uh, i was pretty excited about that i hope you guys come back someday Oh yeah, 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 yeah. I think I mean um, that's right because we were supposed to do some shows leading up to some festival. That yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, who knows now? Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean, like, yeah. like, like I, as of a month ago, we were like, are we doing these shows in September? Like these, like Riot Fest, and then See Here Now and Asbury Park. Um, but now it's like it's looking like there's no kind of turning that yeah. back stuff you know th those all those there's so many festivals that tickets have been sold for and you know i don't think you're going to tell people like you're staying home uh again so no, no you're not. um no. <laughs> yeah you're and not. so yeah so i think that you know who knows like we want to like we were talking about it on a zoom today and we were like man we want to play yeah. <laughs> we was, like we want to go out and play some play some shows we tired of working in this i mean as much as i love the studio it's like I'm going to go out and play. Yeah. Well, we well, hope to see you on the road someday. Exactly. And, you know, your time during Chicago, when you were living in Chicago, we're, we're in the Quad Cities, which is about two and a half hours west of Chicago, right on the Mississippi River border. I don't know if you're yeah. familiar with the area. But, yeah, so uh, when you said Chicago, like, hey, man, don't hate on Chicago too bad. <laughs> so. Oh, no, no. I love Chicago. No, 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 no. I love I, – I, you know, in fact, now that I've been away for about a year, I do miss it quite a bit. You know, um, but I was going to say, like, for you guys, if we're if we're ever nearby and you guys want to just hit me up and I'll make sure you guys get taken care of. Hey, cool. you know what, man? I'm going to hold you to that. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. Well, hey, Jeff, yeah. first of all, number one, thank you for the interview. Yeah, it's about uh, it. And number two course, is, course. And, and thank you for uh, understanding about the, the basement situation with the, the flooding. Uh, <laughs> that's where being a former Chicagoan helps because I know I've had so <laughs> happened to so many friends about yeah. flooded basements. I know it's a thing. It yeah. is. It really is. And then, you know, once again, thank you for all the correspondence and getting this uh, put together for us. And like I no said, problem. you've been a fantastic guest. And uh, when, like I said, when this is all, with Jeff the editing wizard yeah. has this all ready to go in about three weeks. So probably end of June, first part of July, you'll be the first one to get it. Please share it on your socials. We'll share it on ours. And then, like I said, you, um, your episode will also be put up on Rock Rage Radio. And then it goes off to uh, 75 different countries. So yeah. how cool oh, is that? Oh, awesome. And also um, hit me up because I have some new promo photos coming that I would like to use that are like, the, oh, like yeah. 2021. So, cause oftentimes like, you know, I'll do these things and then you'll be like, dude, you used a photo from like nine years ago. <laughs> like, like <laughs> I found on the internet. So please just ask me and, I, and I'll send you new stuff. Yeah. Why, right, don't, cool. why don't you go ahead and do that? Like as soon, as soon as we get off the phone, like text a picture to me so we can put it uh, up or is that possible? Yeah. 
well, no, because I haven't got the newest ones quite yet. You know okay. what I mean? They're, like, they're supposed to come, like, maybe even as early as tomorrow, because I did a shoot for Yamaha. We did a bunch of great photos. Oh, um, cool. And I approved all the ones, but they have to go to the photographer to do whatever final oh, retouching man. and whatnot. So I should be getting I should be getting them soon. But um, if not, well, I ha- it, but if not, hit me up in, like, a couple days. If not, I have some, like, one uh, one or two newer ones of stuff that I that I'd like to that I could use okay. that I can give you okay. for that, that that I've already yeah yeah. Let me uh, I'm gonna send you one that I thought that would look good and you either give me the thumbs up or the thumbs down. How yeah. about that? Okay. Does that sound good, man? Perfect. All right. Perfect. Okay. Thank you so All much. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye, guys. Bye.